you know, Moses had a dream. His dream was, to, God gave him the dream, was to, to, to bring out the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land. But we know they didn't get there. So it's not actually as easy as we may think. And uh, all of us have been on this journey a while, and I know I'm not there yet. <laughs> so, so I think this is a really good message, and I've called it... Um, I better find my notes here. But it, it's taken out of the book of Genesis, and I'll bring you a text shortly. Transitioning from your God-given dream to your destiny. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how many weeks, and it doesn't really matter. We'll just chip away at this as the Holy Spirit leads. And um, every one of us <coughs> have a calling right from Luke's age doesn't matter how old or how young you are, we've all have a calling from God. And I guess if, if, if I ask you individually, do you know what your calling is? The truth is some would and some wouldn't. Um, that's just the way it is. And But God has placed a calling on you and our job is to find out what that calling is. And um, sometimes we're a little bit hard headed that's what i've been called many times and when we're hard-headed we don't hear what god's telling us so we need someone like Anne to step in and say hey i had a dream and and basically that dream will just verify what you already know mm. what god's already showed you or what you've had these thoughts that's all that dream will do it's not like oh follow that dream of Anne. it's all it's doing is clarifying what you already know god's saying hey Silly, wake up. You know, I've been telling you this for a while. Someone else will come and present that to you as well. So the problem is so many of us live in the dream, not in the destiny. So many of us live with the dream, but not in the destiny of that dream. It becomes a hope that we chase all our life and we never, ever get there. And, you know, we're all born with a destiny, a plan, a purpose God places in us. And he will, con he will confirm with each one of us. doesn't matter our age. doesn't matter how much you know your Bible. God will confirm with you that you have a calling, that you have a destiny. And in between the dream and its fulfillment, there is one factor. This is what the Holy Spirit gave me only two days ago. In this message, there is one factor we all have to overcome. And it actually shocked me when I heard this. And this is it. The single factor that determines if we will succeed in God's purpose for us here or not is this one thing. Insecurity. I thought it would have been pride. Insecurity. Insecurity. Insecurity is born in each one of us. From the day we're born, we're born into insecurity. Why? Because before there was sin, there was security. Once there was sin, we are born into insecurity. Man spends his life trying to chase things to create security. Material possessions, positions in life, achievements, in order to find security, when in fact that will never ever give us security. It becomes an endless dream that we're chasing. Hmm. Insecurity is born in each one of us. And it can only be overcome by one thing. And that's truly knowing how much our Heavenly Father loves us. I'm going to prove that in the Word of God today. It's the only way we can overcome insecurity. It doesn't matter what we accomplish. It doesn't matter how beautiful our wife is or our husband is, how rich or poor or whatever our circumstances are, should never alter our security. Never. It doesn't matter what you're going through at the moment, what trial, what test, or how good life is, it should never, ever affect your security. And it's here that many would say, I don't have a problem with insecurity. Well, I'm not going to be your judge, but I think as we get through this lesson, you'll have a better idea. But if what you have <coughs> is removed from you today, I wonder how secure you'll be. <laughs> if your home is taken from you, if your wife, your husband, your children 
your job, your friends, your church, <coughs> if everything is stripped from you, how secure would you be? Now, I'm not saying you all would be insecure, but I'm sure there will be some of us here that would be insecure in that environment. We would not feel comfortable or safe in that environment. We would feel actually a failure. And our mental hospitals are full of people that are there because they feel they've failed. Insecurity. Joseph is born into a family we all know. In the book of Genesis, a, a family that we would call a blended family in today's vernacular. And it's put together not by two mothers, but by four you imagine you're the husband of four wives, two of them official and two of them unofficial. Um, Jacob's got a job. He's got a problem on his hands. Because, of course, when you've got four women and one man and you've got 13 children, you've got a lot of jealousy going on. You've got a lot of striving to be the number one wife, the number one child. And... Um, Joseph is born into this family and he is number 12, 12, I think. Uh, there's one brother who's born after um, Joseph and that is um, Benjamin. There's only two children birthed by their mother, Rachel. So what makes this family special though, this messed up dysfunctional family at that, what makes it really special is so it's okay, you come from a dysfunctional family. Sort of makes me feel better when I hear this. <laughs> but, you know, this is a very special family. It's dysfunctional in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes, this is where the 12 patriarchs come from. This is where the 12 patriarchs that will stand behind God's throne when we stand in heaven come from. Each one of these dysfunctional brothers are going to be standing as God's leaders in heaven. And that sort of gives me a bit of comfort knowing that God can use dysfunctional people, people that have come from messed up households or even ungodly, you know, as we would call it, households. So Joseph is born into this and he's the son of Rachel, the wife of Jacob, who is the one that Jacob we know loves the most. I'll give a little bit of background. And, and she gives birth to only two children, but it's a fair way down the track she does this. There's 12 boys and one girl, and both of the children born of Rachel, the Bible tells us that Jacob loved those children with a special love. There was something special about Rachel's children, and we know because when he cast his eyes on Rachel, he wanted to marry her, and he didn't. Well, the, it sounds like a bad story, like he's being done, but the truth is Rachel's very, very young at the time. And in, 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 in Jewish history, the older of the family always would be married off before the younger, and Rachel being the younger, so it couldn't have happened in, in their society. So the, the, the father of Rachel and Leah marries off Leah, as we know, and, and Jacob ends up with her. But his heart is still longing for this young Rachel, who, by the way, is barren, and she can't have children. I've done a little bit of study into this. At, at, at the time um, Jacob marries Rachel, he would have been 90 to 91 years old. Um, <laughs> Rachel is around the age yeah. of 18 if not touching 18, just under the age of 18. So when he first met her, she's only a, a kid. She's still a kid when she marries him. So we a bit like Mary and Joseph. Joseph's already an old man when he marries Mary, who's a young girl, and Jesus is born. So this is a very interesting story. Uh, what makes this really interesting, if you go back in the lineage, follow the direct lineage, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, is barren before Isaac is born. And, and, and the, the, the mother is also barren of Isaac. So the grandmother was barren at that time when, when, when the, the child was born. The mother was barren and she was barren. 
I don't think it was a coincidence. I, I don't want to build some doctrine on it. I don't yeah. think it's a coincidence. I think the enemy got in there somehow. He wanted to stop this lineage happening. The interesting thing is, Jesus isn't born out of the lineage of Rachel. He's born out of the lineage of Leah, the first wife. Yeah. Which I, I find that really, really fascinating. Um, so God sent a son to the world, but through the lineage of Leah, not through the lineage of Rachel. So anyway, just a bit of background on this. Um, what is interesting is these three women all were barren, and in order to have the child of promise, they had to be faith. And I found that really interesting when I dwelt on that. Because God honors faith, and all these women couldn't have children, but cried out to God in faith, and he gave them a child. Mm. At the age of 17, um, Joseph's given the dream. So he's still a kid. He, he's not an adult at this age. Yet it's not until he's 30 years old that Joseph actually steps into the dream. Does he start living the dream? Not, not completes it, starts living it. So we've got a gap of 13, 13 years. Is that right in between? that Joseph is sorting out his life. This is the transition from the dream to the fulfillment of the dream. And before Joseph starts his destiny, his purpose, his calling, he's faced with ten tests. That's what I've extracted from this story, and that's what we're going to look at. There's ten very clear tests that Joseph faces from the beginning of the dream until he steps into fulfilling the dream. And um, the time allotted to sit these tests is entirely up to you and me. Because each one of us are going to have to face these ten tests. I'm not trying to build a ten series message, by the way. You literally will see there is ten tests he faces. Each one of us will have to face them if we want to fulfill the destiny God has for us or our calling. And not only face them, but each one of us will have to pass the test. Because in God's education system, you have to pass one test before you move on to the next one. We cannot skip the past test. We cannot go past that test. We just have to keep coming back to it, keep coming back to that same test. And sadly, a lot of people get stuck on the first test, never get past it. The ten character tests each of us are going to face are what we're going to look at. We're going to track the life of Joseph from the dream until he steps into it. And I know that each one of us will find ourselves in the story as I found myself in it. <laughs> I know we will. My prayer is at the end of this, not today, but wherever this finishes, every blind spot in our life will be exposed. And we'll know exactly what we need to do to walk in our God-given destiny. That's my prayer for each one of us today. The first test Joseph encounters is pride. The mother of all tests. God always starts with the hardest one first. And this test is given to each of us. Every other test is linked to pride. Every other test is linked to this. This is the root of every problem we ever will encounter. Whatever problems you've had in your life, this is the root cause. Pride. And Joseph delays this test through making a big mistake. And he brags. Because when he gets the dream... He starts bragging about the dream. And I've got to be really honest here and transparent. I have blown it here so many times. We, God gives me something. And I go running out and I share it with people I have no business sharing it with. Mm. I don't know about you. I may be the only one guilty here. But I can totally relate here to Joseph. Mm. Joseph runs out straight away. 
No doubt he's excited. He's heard from God. It's like, wow, God's speaking to me. I've just got to share this with somebody. And that's fine. But be careful who it is. And Joseph takes no care, no thought that his brothers already hate him. And this is only going to provoke them even more. <laughs> I've done the same. And, you know, thank God in God's education system, there is no such thing as a fail. I love that about God. It's the only education system in this world where you do not fail. God doesn't have fail in his vernacular when you sit the test and you don't succeed. All you have to do is reset it again. And you just keep resetting it until you pass. And that's how God works. But sometimes we just need to shut our mouths. Sometimes we just need to zip it. Even when it's God. And not bring out what he's telling us to those that are going to use it against us. Because God looks at the heart. Man looks on the outward. So Joseph sets himself up for the very thing James instructs us not to do, be slow to speak. Joseph's not slow to speak, he runs out, he doesn't use wisdom and he shares. Not with one person, but a whole group of them. God's told me this, and you're going to do this. And all of a sudden, Joseph is bragging, and he puts himself back into the pride test. He's just failed it. Failed it in the sense that he has to reset it again. No doubt excitement is the motivation. I can relate to that. And sometimes we genuinely believe that we're helping someone when we do that. But God will judge our motive. We need to be careful who we share our life with. There are times we think we're helping a person when what we're really doing is hindering what God is doing in their life. Sometimes we see a brother or a sister uh, in the Lord or literally a family member and our compassion, our heart goes out to them because we think they should not have to be in that situation. But God is saying... They're in that situation because I have them in that situation for a purpose. They need to overcome this. An alcoholic, the wife of an alcoholic husband, enables her husband by allowing the problem to continue. And the same it is with us sometimes. We try to rescue people when we should let God rescue them. Because he has a shorter route than the way we would try and do it. Rescuing quite often is pride. In other words, well, she can't get herself out of that problem and it looks like nobody else is helping her, so I'm going to have to be the one. <laughs> Look out. Pride. Pride. Genesis chapter 37, if you've got your Bibles. Let's have a look at the story. This is going to stir your hearts, the story, because it did mine, so I think it will you. Genesis 37, starting at verse 1. Um, there's going to be a little bit of reading today because we need to lay the foundation for the future of this. Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. We're going to read through to verse 11. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bela in the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Notice the Bible says it's his father's wives. It's actually the maids of the wives. But God sees it as wives here. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. And uh, just to clarify who these two people are, Zilpah was a maid of Leah, and the, the, the other one is Bilhar is a maid of Rachel, the second wife of Jacob and Rachel becomes jealous, of course. So the story is because Rachel can't produce children, Rachel gives a maid to Jacob, and then the other one gets jealous and does the same. So carry on, verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. 
also he made him a tunic of many colours or a coat. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. I guess so, because they would have been provoked by the dream. And so he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There was, we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. And then he dreamed... Sorry, then he dreamed still another dream, so another confirmation of this dream. And he told it to his brothers again. Joseph doesn't know when to stop. (laughs) And he told it to his brothers again. Um, I've lost my place, I'm sorry. Uh, Verse 9. Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to you uh, before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. I think that's an important thing to hang on to there. His father didn't discount that this could be real. And then the brothers went out to feed their flocks and check him. Now, Joseph had been given a dream. There is no doubt about it from God. However, he should have kept it to himself. There are things that God gives us through other people, even over the pulpit, even over a telephone, even over the internet, that sometimes we should keep it to ourselves. We need to zip it. Why? Because God's given, he's entrusted you. He's entrusted me with that. And he's testing us, if you like, to see what we'll do with what he's entrusted us with. So Joseph should have kept it to himself instead of bragging. And of course it provokes his brothers. And they already hated him. And this is interesting. There's a hatred there. But remember, Jacob's already an old man. So he's got lots of time to spend with Joseph. Maybe when he was younger, he didn't have the same amount of time for Reuben and the other brothers because he's busy. He's having to work hard. And this is life for all of us. Sometimes we grow up in a household where our parents have been extremely busy. And then we want to punish them later on in life and say, they weren't here for me. They didn't do that. And and, and we get into this pity party. The reality is that's life. Parents are busy. Parents are busy. They do their best. But by this time, Jacob has got a lot of time on his hands. And Joseph knows how to use it wisely. And so he clings into his father. He gets close to him. And that tells me something. We need to get close to daddy. And he said, but I don't have time. We all have the same amount of time. It's what we do with that time. Sometimes when you stay close to daddy, it causes jealousy with the other family members. You ever been in a church where people are jealous of you? How can she be hearing from God? Who does she think she is? How can he hear from God? Who does he think he is? It's my father also. I'd hear from him if it was real. And we discount that our brother, our sister, has actually heard from daddy. And why has she heard? Because she's staying close to him. It'll provoke jealousy. Why is it Joseph has dreams and we don't? I'm sure that's what the enemy used on the brothers. Self-righteous so-and-so. Who does he think he is? These four boys are all born out of jealousy. All of these four boys are born out of jealousy. The mothers were jealous, and of course, that same spirit is in the sons. Joseph has a destiny ahead, but he needs to deal with the root of pride. 
And for us who struggle with pride, the reason it keeps repeating itself in our life is we haven't dealt with the root of it. And I know everyone sitting here and thinking, I don't have pride. And that's kind of an indication you do, <laughs> if anyone thinks that way. Because we all are troubled with this sin. The root of pride is insecurity. Insecurity. I took this a step further. I said, Satan fell because of pride. This is something to go away and dwell on. Why? I believe he was busy. He was the head charang. He's the top dog. He had a lot of work on his hands. I believe he's busy. I don't believe he was always around the father. I believe he was busy carrying out his job. He become insecure. You say angels can't become insecure. Oh, yes, they can. Angels can also sin. We know that because a third of them were thrown out of heaven. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I don't believe was only in the Garden of Eden. I believe it's also in heaven. You say there's no evil in heaven. God had to create all beings to have a choice. Otherwise we're a robot. Angels have a choice, just like you and me. So if pride's in our heart, insecurity is in our soul or in our mind. And insecurity comes from a person not feeling secure in who they are. It's that simple. Insecurity is the outward manifestation of not understanding or, I'll use the word, not knowing the Father. Knowing in the sense of intimacy. You might know about him, but not being intimate with him. That's where insecurity comes from. And some of the issues that could reveal this insecurity, or the fruit, as Jesus said, by their fruit you'll know them. Uh, you know, maybe the parent or our parent has been so busy with the demands of life, and then that causes insecurity in us because we don't have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Maybe the parents have fought a lot. They argue and they fight. Maybe they're divorced. It creates insecurity in the child. Broken marriages create insecurity in children. And the only way to overcome insecurity, the only way, is to know the Father intimately. There is no other way. No psychology, no psychiatrist, no pills, no nothing. Knowing the Father intimately. So Joseph learns very quickly to get Daddy's attention by staying close to him, which works as we see... Daddy rewards him for it in the coat. That's his gift. Each one of us have been given a gift by the Father. And a gift that's an expression of the Father's love for his son, which of course we know provokes this insecurity in Joseph's brothers. And insecurity is always caused from a belief. That belief says, I am not loved. I know this... This should be touching your hearts because this is the core of every human being. The only way to combat this belief is knowing how much you are loved by the one who gave his son in exchange for your life. That's such a hard concept. Even for Christians who have been a Christian a long time, it's such a hard concept to get in around our heads that someone would give their child, their son, in exchange for me. Like, why would you give your child for me? Why would you do that? I mean, that's, that's such a difficult concept for a human being to comprehend. But that's where we have to come to. And the trick of the enemy is to get us to, to believe this. If I just do lots of stuff, for the Father, if I get busy and do stuff for Him, He'll love me more. It's not true. We don't need to do stuff to please the Father. There's only one thing He wants from us, and it's intimacy. That's all He wants. It's not even winning souls. Sometimes we think if we go out and win souls, or we go out and lay hands on the sick, or we go out and do this and do that, we're going to impress the Father, and we're just going to win more brownie points, and it doesn't work that way. 
he would rather you pull aside into intimacy and have intimacy with him. Just bring it into the natural sense here, if it's your child. And your child said to your mummy, Daddy, I, I'll do one of two things, just tell me. I'll go out and I'll, I'll cut the lawns and I'll wash the house and I'll clean the car and I'll do this and I'll do that. Or I'll sit down with you on the couch and just love on you and talk to you. What would you rather? He'd say, forget the car. <laughs> sit down. And that's what he is interested in. We spend our life running from that. We spend our life getting busy. Trying to do stuff for him. There's nothing wrong with doing stuff for him, please. But, but there's a perspective here or there's a priority. If we haven't got the first one right, the second one is a waste of time. If I just do stuff for him, he'll love me. It's not true. All he wants is you. All he wants is to spend time with you. And now Joseph has given a dream from his heavenly father. First he has been rewarded by his earthly daddy. And now by his heavenly daddy. That's not a bad deal. Earthly daddy's rewarded him. Now his heavenly daddy has. Because after all, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Uh -huh. There's no doubt in my mind, Joseph's mother had sought the Lord on behalf of his son. Godly mothers are worth their weight in gold. Godly mothers are worth their weight in gold. Prayer is more powerful than anything a mother can do. And I know that Joseph's mother was a prayer. It's in the Bible. When she couldn't have a child, she cried out to the Lord, the Bible says. And Joseph's about to find out with every new level of responsibility given, there is new levels of insecurity also given. Please get that. With every new level of responsibility we have in our life, there is a new level of insecurity that you've got to deal with. It's not all the same. Promotion always brings that feeling, I cannot do this. You ever been in that place, you've been promoted, and you think, oh my God, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this. Whatever it may be. I, I, me? I'm not equipped to do this. I, I don't know how to do this. Promotion always brings insecurity, a new level of insecurity that you have to conquer. And this is the point where I've gone wrong, and maybe you, and certainly some. When I say this, you'll think of someone immediately where we go wrong. This is where, because we're afraid, I can't do this, I can't do this, we run out and we try and gather people to get them on side to do it with us. Come and help me do this. Come. And you start waving a flag, the white flag. Help me. God's given me a dream. He's told me to go here and plant a church or do a ministry or do this or do that. But I need your help because I can't do it. God and me aren't enough. I need your help. And this is where it all goes bad. Because God didn't call Sister Delilah or Sister Anna or Sister Amy or whatever to fulfill my dream. He called me to fulfill that dream. And if he told me a dream, he will give me everything and everyone I need to fulfill that. I don't need to go out and solicit help. There is a sign of someone who is not passing the security test. And after all, if God gave you the dream, he's the one who's going to make it happen. You can't even make it happen yourself. He wants empty vessels, meaning he doesn't want you with your knowledge. He wants you empty so he can fill you. <laughs> he will bring it to pass. He will provide all that we need. And the test that comes with promotion is always going to be the brag test. And I believe this is where Joseph went wrong. I believe the dream was so big. It was so hard for him to understand that he thought, I've just got to get some people on side here to believe the dream. 
I've just got to get some people to stand with me in this. So he rushes out and he blabs his mouth. Once again, we see insecurity in Joseph needing to get someone else's affirmation. But this is going to cost Joseph his promotion. This is going to cause many years to be added to what didn't need to be added to the calling. We all have a destiny from God and that is so important for each of us to fulfill. Each one of us have that. Yet one word can describe what stops us reaching that destiny. Character. Character. When our character will not support our destiny, we will not fulfill it until such time we've passed all the tests. Character. Because God will not allow it to happen. God will not allow it to happen. Why? Because he loves us too much. He doesn't want to... He'll give you the dream and it will be huge. But he doesn't want you to step into that dream or me into that dream prematurely because he knows that dream will crush us. He knows we'll end up thinking we're the ones fulfilling this. And it wasn't until Joseph was in his 40s that he fulfilled his dream. Remember, he's called at 17. But he's in his mid-40s when he fulfills the dream. It's a long time. And you think that's a long time. Of course, we can look at Moses. Moses, Moses is 40 years, but doesn't fulfill it. That's kind of scary, because it gives us an insight into these great men that we look up to of God. And they just didn't have a dream and step into it and fulfill that dream. Each one of us need to ask this question. What is my character that God wants me to address? What is it in my character that he wants me to address? If you're up to it, I'll just run into the second test and then I'll stop there. Are you okay at the moment? Okay, I'll give you one more. The next test was, we call it the pit test. This is the pit stop. <laughs> and uh, in Genesis 37, verse 13, through to verse 24, I'll read it quickly. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come and I'll send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it's all well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out in the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now certain men found him and there he was, wandering in the field. So Joseph's out there just enjoying the field, daydreaming. And the man asked him, where are you going or who are you seeking? And, and he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they've departed from here. And I heard them say, let's go on to Dothan. So Joseph went out after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now before they saw him, now sorry, so now when they saw him, afar off, before getting close to them, they conspired to kill him. Nice kind of brothers. <laughs> It's Joseph. Let's kill him. How are we going to do it? Can you imagine the picture? I mean, you've been in that environment with a fa you know, family member that this, you know, that, and, and they conspire against you. Now, I'm not talking down on any family member here. And this is what Joseph is up against. But he doesn't know. Joseph doesn't know they want to kill him. Verse 19, then they said to one another, look at this dreamer coming. Come therefore and let us now kill him and cast him into the pit and we shall say that a wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams then. But when Reuben heard it and delivered him, sorry, but when Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands, he said to them, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, don't shed any blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness. And do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. This is the oldest brother, Reuben. Reuben 
despite even in him there is a weariness of this boy Joseph. Reuben doesn't want to hurt him. He wants to get him back to his father because he knows the brothers are going to eat him. And so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the tunic of many colours that's on him, and then they took him and cast him into the pit. And the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. So this test, we call it the pit test. Um, I don't know about you, have you ever been in one? Because when you're in one, you can't see out of it. All you can see is the prison walls, the four walls. I think our sister said something similar a couple of weeks ago. You're in the situation. You feel like you've been imprisoned and you cannot see anywhere except darkness. You can just see the walls directly in front of you. This is what Joseph is in. And he's faced with this test. And what happens is this. Satan always comes. Always comes and tempts us to focus on another and not on ourselves. What we do, I'm here because of my brothers, my husband, my wife, my sisters, whatever. I'm here because of them, my daughter, my son. And this is what Satan wants us to do, is to focus on that. And this is his plan of deception. Because see, deception is never a straight out lie, it's a part truth blended with deceptions. And we focus on that person being the cause of why I'm here, when in fact what we need to do is look up and focus on ourselves. God, why am I here? What have I done to cause some of this to happen? Because we never cause all the problem, but we're always a part of it in some form. See, part deception and truth always make a lie. And that's how Satan works. He's the father of lies. He cannot tell the truth. But he uses deception to make the lie sound like truth. So in our minds, we're in this pit and we say, if he hadn't have done that to me, I wouldn't be in this situation. Rather than say, I did something to cause this. Now's the time for soul searching. Now's the time we pray, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Know my thoughts. Tell me if there's any wicked way in me. What did I do to attribute to this situation? And it's at this point in the pit test, the pride test is before us again. Because the pride test wants to blame. So we're faced with the same thing. It's not me, it's somebody else. They've done terrible things to me. And our focus goes on them rather than myself. And God wants to free us from the pit, but our focus is outward instead of inward. And this is what many of us do. We blame another, we blame someone. It's not the action that puts us in the pit. It's our reaction. It's our reaction to the action. It's our reaction to the action that matters. And then it's our reaction that will keep us in the pit. How are we going to react to what's happened to me? How am I going to react to the situation? So from that point on, we're faced now with the pride test again. Joseph's identity is found in his relationship with his father. I think that's really clear to all of us. It's seen in the coat that he wears. But maybe he shouldn't have wore the coat when he visited the brothers. <laughs> Didn't he use much wisdom? There was nothing wrong with the coat. That's the gift from the father. But sometimes we want to flaunt the gift. And that's pride. And Joseph got the gift from his father. But because of pride, he loses the gift. He loses the gift. And this is interesting. The gift goes back to the Father. And yeah. we all know that scripture in Romans eleven twenty nine that even I've misinterpreted at times that says the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. And this is 
this is misquoted. This is what the Holy Spirit showed me this week. It's talking about the Jewish nation. Read it in context. Read it in context. For the sake of their fathers, Abraham, they are loved. And for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. It, the writer is referring to the Jewish nation. He's not saying God won't remove our gift. And I'm not saying God will remove our gift because actually there's nothing in the Bible that tells us one way or the other. But it wasn't the Father that removed the gift. We must remember that. It was the ones that hated him remove the gift. And the ones that hate us is the enemy, Satan. He's the one that has a legal right to remove your gift or my gift if we leave or open a door for him. Fast forward some years and Joseph no longer has one coat. Maybe Joseph's got a lot of coats. He's now the top charang. He's the head cheese in the nation. I'm sure he could buy a thousand of those coats now. So God gives back more than what was taken. We can see it here. When we repent, God will always give back much more than what's been stolen. Did he get back that particular coat? I, I doubt it. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But I'm sure he got given a much greater coat. If we lose something, God will always bountifully give back more than what's been taken. If we honour him and conquer these tests. Mm. After finding ourselves in the pit, we need to get God's perspective. Like our sister said the other week, we need to look up. Noah looked up in the ark because he didn't have a window in front to look out. We need to get God's perspective of the storm. You can't see anything except these walls. And when you're looking at those walls, all we think about is why I'm here. What's caused this event? Pride. As soon as we start thinking someone else is the cause of our problem, it's pride. And we'll stay in the pit and we won't get out of it. Does God want us to get out? Absolutely. He doesn't want us there, not for one minute. But he will leave us there. And I want to encourage you today, don't be quick to pull people out of the pit. You say, that sounds terrible. No. Allow the person to get his perspective, not yours. Because so often we want to rescue. We need to focus on what got me here. And every time we're in that place, the accuser's going to show up. So we need to be aware of whose perspective, whose perspective are we listening to? Whose perspective? We need to get our Heavenly Father's perspective of the pit. Don't listen to Satan's perspective because it always will condemn. Here's a hint. It will always condemn. A heavenly father never, ever condemns. Condemnation does not come from God. God's perspective will convict us of what we did wrong so we can repent. But he never leaves us without hope. Never, ever. If we repent, we've got confidence God will restore all that has been stolen. This is a really big issue for each of us because some of us are struggling more than others. Conviction is specific. Specific. Condemnation is general. Conviction is you did this and you did that and you're in this pit because you did that. Condemnation is so different. It says you'll never be any good. You've blown it again. See? Nobody likes you. They all hate you. That's conviction. The condemnation. Conviction will always point out the sin. I mean, the Apostle Paul tells her, you see your brother in sin, you go to them. But you don't rub it in their face and say, you're useless, you're never going to overcome this. Because that's not God's way. Mm. Oh dear. And I've just lost. Oh, thank you.
Thank you. It's back again. Thank God for technology. So conviction is specific. Condemnation is general. Mm. God never condemns you for what you've done. Never. Never. Proof? Okay. John chapter 3, verse 17. We all know John 3, 16. God so loved the world. For God did not, we'll say it again, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. That's not His job. But the world through Him might be saved. Verse 18. And he who believes in Him is not condemned. He who believes, what he's saying here, it's not this is a quid, I believe in God. It's not what he's saying. It's, it's bigger than that. He who believes his word will act upon it. He who believes in him or in his word or in his truth is not condemned. But he who doesn't believe is condemned. In other words, condemnation we bring upon ourselves because we don't believe truth. And so we try and fix our problems often instead of handing them over to Him. And what He wants us to do is to give them to Him rather than you say, I'll try and sort this out. My family, I need to be here. I need to do this to sort them out. No, you don't. That's pride. That's pride. And that will bring condemnation. Conviction said, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. And you move on. So why do we who have repented feel guilty? I get these crazy thoughts like this. I was writing down and share them with you. Why do we who have repented feel guilty from time to time? And the answer is this. Because we want to fix the problem ourselves. <laughs> Rather than allow him to fix it. And we go back into the pride test again. And Jesus came to save us from our condemnation because we were already condemned. Sin condemns. Period. It's not just talking about salvation. Sin always condemns. It's self-condemning. Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies. And actually it's impossible for Satan to tell the truth. And when he condemns, he's lying. When you hear that voice of condemnation... It's the enemy. He twists, he manipulates to serve his own purpose. And if we look at Genesis chapter 37, verse 31 and 32, I'll just read this quickly because I'm going to wrap it up. So they took Joseph's tunic, they killed a kid of the goats. In other words, a baby goat. They dipped it in blood and then they sent him the tunic of many colors. They took it to the father and they said, we found this. Do you know if this is your son's? <laughs> Liars. They knew all along what's going down here. There's always got to be death when there's condemnation. Death to something. Something is going to die when you feel condemnation. And they sent the coat to the Father with foulness. Do you know if it says or not? You know what's cruel here? I don't know if you ever thought about this. They want to punish the father. They're wanting to punish the father. H how could you live with yourself? You're living with your parent. And you've set this terrible situation up. And for how many years he suffers thinking his son is dead. And they don't care about it. Nice well, sort of sons. <laughs> Nice sort of children. The sort of children nobody needs to have. These are the ones that will stand around the throne of God, by the way. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. These are the ones that stand with the 24 elders around the throne in the book of Revelation. But you see, God is forgiving and merciful. And his heart is to always bring transformation. Mm. 22 years Jacob suffers. 22 years. Imagine that. You think your son is dead, your daughter is dead. The pain of believing that must have been incredible. And it wasn't until Joseph's 39 does his father see him again or even know that he exists. 
I believe Joseph and his father, he had his father's favour because he stayed close to him. I think there's something we need to hold on to. He wanted to please him as we all do. And here's a secret. Stay close to him. Stay close. It's worth the cost. Let me ask you today, has your gift been stolen from you? Yeah. Has the thing that is more important to you, that has been given to you by the Father, been taken from you? For Joseph it was his coat, but more than that, something that kept him warm and reminded him of Daddy. Reminded him Daddy is with me. And even more than that, Joseph had his family stolen from him. Not only did he lose his gift, he lost his family. And could it be your family that's been stolen? Could it be your health that's been stolen? Could it be your ministry that's been ripped and torn and others have lied about you? And now you feel like Joseph, you feel alone. And it seems that nobody cares and all you think about is the mistakes that you've made. And how you could have done things differently. Let me encourage you to stop trying to fix it. Don't listen to that voice of condemnation. It's really simple. We repent and we move on. We repent of what we've been convicted of. And we move on and allow the Father to deal with it. If he truly is in control of my life, I should have full confidence that he's going to sort it out. I should not be trying to struggle with this myself. And when those struggles come straight away, you should know that's the enemy speaking to you. Stop trying to fix it. Stop listening to the voice of condemnation. Remember, you've been called, I've been called, and you are in a transition, I'm in a transition of this calling. This is only a pit stop. And when you go into the pit stop, you go there to refuel. This is a time of refueling. This is a time of improvement, not of devastation. Mm. Mm. You say, I haven't got my gift. And the Lord wants to remind us the gift that's waiting ahead is much, much better than what's been stolen. What is the purpose of this pit? What is the purpose of it? The purpose of every pit is to get us to cry out to God. What else can you do when you're in the pit except cry out, help? And there's no one else around except those who want to harm you. But God will use them, your enemies, for his good. That's his promise to us. And when he sends someone to bring you out of the pit, please hear this. Find contentment with the person he has sent. Don't fight and resist that God has sent someone to get you out of that pit. And often what we do is someone will come along God has sent for our benefit to help us. And we resist what that person is saying or trying to do. We don't feel comfortable. We have to go back to the old ways because we're going to fix this thing. And that's pride. And I'm learning the worst thing to do is to try and get someone out of the pit when they're not ready to get out. We need wisdom, discernment. We often try all we can to help someone who's going through a hardship, especially if it's family. And when they're not ready to receive help from heaven, we end up getting hurt ourselves. We need to know when to pull back, when to shut our mouths, leave them in the pit, and remember that God's in charge. The purpose of the pit, in closing in verse 22, And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, cast him into the pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might, Reuben, deliver him back to his father's hands. 
That is the purpose of the pit, that my life, that your life, will be returned back to the Father's hands. In other words, it wasn't there before. Sometimes we deceive ourselves. We think we're close when we're not. But the purpose of this pit is to hand us back to the Father. Reuben's the eldest brother, the firstborn. And Reuben was first in line to receive the Father's blessing. He was the head of the house. He was the head of this motley crew, as Mike would call them. Yet he stood in the gap for Joseph from saving his death. Colossians 1 tells us Jesus was the firstborn of the Father. He stood in the gap for the motley crew. Us. Huh? He came to the, this earth to deliver us out of the pit. Are you in the pit? Are you there because of your making or somebody else's or a combination of the two? The Father wants to deliver us out. I pray today that the Holy Spirit will use this as really an introduction I've given into the story to stir our hearts. Because sometimes we want to get to the end of the test before we overcome the first one. The timing is up to us. I remember my youngest, who's very bright, as most of you know, he was sitting at a an exam at a very, very high level and he completed the exam in less than an hour. It was meant to, he was given three hours and he walked out of the classroom after an hour. And he was questioned, why did you leave so early? Did you give up? He said, no, I've completed it. Some can complete the test quickly. And some of us take a lot longer, like me. We need to Focus on the tests in our life, not focus on the tests in others. Because how can we help someone when we haven't helped ourselves? Father, thank you for this word. I know it's, it's a word that will stir each one of us. Because each one of us probably can see ourselves somewhere in this story. Lord, your heart is for us. You. Father, you gave yes. your son in exchange for me in exchange for my sister, in exchange for my brother. When we didn't deserve it, we had no right, but that's how much you loved us and you wanted to show us there wasn't a greater price that one could pay. You gave the ultimate price, the price that probably not one of us here could pay. And I say probably because it, it, it's impossible for us to give up our child for the sake of another child. But Lord, you did it for us. Let us have an awareness you're not against us, you're for us. That, that some of us have painted such a big devil and such a small God and yet you're such a big God and he's such a small devil and he's being defeated. Yes. We need to remember if we're in combat with the devil all the time, there's something wrong. Because you've conquered him already. We just have to step into that. Oh Lord, teach us your ways. Open our hearts, open our minds. Let us be willing, no matter how young or how old we are, to make the changes necessary. To lay down pride, to get out of the pit. And to allow others to stand with us through this. Thank you, Father, for your word that's alive and powerful. And cuts into our heart. Cuts into our minds, divides truth from deception. We give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen.